We are here tonight after being given a first-hand look at the devastation in Lahaina. We traveled by boat with two captains who answered the call that night. For the first time here, we see the images they captured of the raging fires and the heat they felt as they approached by water. Tonight, with more than 100 dead here and more than 1,000 missing, so many questions remain. Could the authorities have done more? Tonight, the images we have not seen before, the raging inferno in the distance. These are the images captured by two captains as they made their way into Lahaina from the water. Told by the Coast Guard, people were desperate for help, families trapped at the water's edge, so many jumping in, children among them, waiting in the angry waters for hours, the ocean churning from the winds, all to escape the flames racing down the hill, some of those flames traveling a mile a minute. Tonight, for the first time, we take that journey back with those captains traveling along Maui's western edge. Just a haunting scene here all along Front Street where so many families and, and the people of Lahaina came down the hill to try to escape the flames uh, and the heat. So many jumping in the water here uh, just to survive. As the two captains got closer to the harbor after nightfall, they could feel the heat, the blinding smoke. We've all seen the images of the, of the people who jumped in the water to, just to survive this uh, and who were huddled along Front Street here. We were expecting the worst on the way in. And so we had, we had big spotlights up here, flashlights searching. It was, there was so much smoke in the air, your flashlight beam would only go about 100 feet or so. As we look at it here, you can see that people had no place to go other than the water or the one road out of town. I mean, they were trapped. Sorry, sorry. It is still too raw. Captain Riley Coons and Captain Travis DeWater, they were both there that night. Well, it looked like a zombie apocalypse. Everything was on fire. Uh, everybody was just covered in soot. Their faces were covered in, in, in soot from the fire? Yeah, They're, I mean, everything. Everything. Everybody was kind of covered in, in soot. So many people who were actually even in the water were holding like a t-shirt up to their face just to breathe through it. But the best I could tell there was a girl that was nine and a boy that was like 11 or 12. Um, <clears throat> they were pretty scared, showed up out of the dark and took them, took them paddling out through the waves. Uh, who I think was a young boy, the older one was encouraging his sister uh, to be strong and it was pretty touching. When you look at these charred buildings and the melted cars all along Front Street, I mean, it's as though these families just, they got trapped. When you think about the, the people still unaccounted for here. It's, it's just one of the heaviest um, thoughts to think about. I know that there's, um, I, I got three young kids and I just imagine what, what would it, I'm just so thankful I, you know, I wasn't in here. I heard stories that people would just see um, families huddled together and it said it looks like it's Pompeii. They're just calcified, frozen in time. And then when I heard that, because <clears throat> the uh, schools were in that day, it was so windy that a lot of these were, were children <sighs> at home. It's <sighs> just too much. The images of that night, the families, parents and their children in their cars, they won't forget. Tonight, ABC News with an in-depth look at the timeline. How did this happen? It was more than a week ago, Monday evening, August 7th, 1047 p.m. A surveillance camera capturing this moment, a flash video of what could have been an early trigger in these deadly fires, a power line arcing. Witness Jennifer Pribble. It's windy and then there's a flash and I think right. that's when a tree is falling on a power line and the forest is on fire. The data compiled by Whisker Labs, a private company monitoring the grid through a network of sensors here, documenting dozens of major electrical incidents around Lahaina. We've got that video of that kind of explosion, and we've got 10 sensors in that community that show a very sharp drop in electrical voltage at precisely that same time. 
at 6.54 Tuesday morning, eight hours later, you can see Jennifer and a coworker running with a garden hose and a fire extinguisher, trying to put out the flames. It was just minutes earlier, 6.37 a.m., Shane True, woken up by the howling winds. Power line just went down. In that moment, Definitely using a hose, hose to try to protect his home from the fires that he says appears to have been caused by a downed power line. That's the power line that started, started from up the road there. Authorities then declaring that fire under control around 9 a.m. that morning, but then losing control of the flames hours later when the winds caused a flare-up to spread. Nice gust right there. Those winds 60 to 80 miles per hour. Yeah, see how long this pole's going to hang in. A power line pole beginning to shake, the winds intensifying, debris flying, that pole rocking. The winds like rocket fuel for the fires. Tonight, demand for accountability and serious questions about whether alerts were sent when they should have been and whether sirens should have been sounded. Was there a widespread alert? No, no, there wasn't. Uh, it, uh, it, was, it seemed sporadic. I'm going to have to say that the government could have done a little bit better. None of the sirens were activated. The head of Hawaii's emergency management agency defending the decision not to sound those alarms, saying he has no regrets. Do you regret not sounding the sirens? I, I do not. The sirens, as I had mentioned earlier, is used primarily for tsunamis. Had we sounded the siren that night, we we're afraid that people would have gone into the fire. Late tonight, that administrator for the Maui Emergency Management Agency has now turned in his resignation, citing health reasons. And tonight, Maui's mayor has now accepted, saying, quote, given the gravity of the crisis we are facing, my team and I will be placing someone in this key position as quickly as possible. And I look forward to making that announcement soon. I don't want to leave here. In this neighborhood, disbelief, people rushing to evacuate in their cars. By 3.52 p.m., the reflection in the side view mirror, a glimpse of what was coming directly at them. Eric Zimmerman capturing these images as the dark smoke overtakes the sky. Four o'clock in the afternoon here. Smoke is crazy. I got ash all over my face. The Hopper family here on vacation, praying in their car. Just keep us safe. 4.46 p.m., the fire and smoke overtaking Lahaina. By 5 p.m., historic Front Street, filled with businesses and restaurants, was on fire. The explosions. At 5.02, Denny Euchert holding his phone out his window. Gridlock on Front Street. Families were trapped. Smoke and fire all around them. You can feel the heat off the traffic. Denny, not sure what would come next, recording this message to his family. If I don't make it through this, I love everybody. Look at that. Two blocks away, Marjorie St. Clair driving away from her home, trying to find a way out. Lahaina is on fire. By 5.30 p.m., the fire on Front Street, so ferocious, families including Noah Tompkinson's, have made the impossible decision to abandon their cars and jump into the ocean. Both sides to the left and the right are on fire. So many clinging to the shoreline, covering their mouths and their eyes. At one point, it seemed like I might drown a little bit. I inhaled a lot of water. When Sean Doherty swam out of the water and got back onto land, he was badly burned. I couldn't even make it across the street because the pavement was so hot. And now I have second degree burns on the bottom of the feet. Bosco Bay leaving his workplace on Front Street at 5.36 p.m., just one block from Noah's vantage point. Embers barreling toward him and in the direction of Denny Euchert's car. 5.59 p.m., just one block away, Denny Euchert has now abandoned his car, crossing the street and sheltering on the rocks of the harbor. Dozens of people are sitting across the rocks as the waves crash over them. 9.39 p.m., homes, buildings, burned to the ground. Okay. Two hours later, 11.30 p.m., a half an hour before those two captains arrive in the harbor to help, this nighttime drone with the view from above. Tonight, more than a week later, increased scrutiny on the utility company Hawaiian Electric. That company saying they are still investigating what triggered the fire, adding that the cause has not been determined. And Hawaii's attorney general now launching an investigation into the response. At least three lawsuits have now been filed against that utility company, alleging turning off the power could have saved lives, preventing electrical fires. 
Hawaiian Electric defending its actions, saying power was needed to keep the water running. But authorities say in some places that ultimately failed too. Firefighters reporting that some fire hydrants had run dry. In Lahaina, the electricity powers the pumps that provide the water. And so that was also a critical um, need during that time. And it was around midnight that night, those two captains, Riley and Travis, arrive in that harbor, only to find the raging fires and the blinding smoke. A week later, they're aware they were not the only ones who raced in to help. A lot of people here did a lot of heroic work, huh? The community has been amazing on the response side. It, I mean, there was other boats out here that night. We're not the only ones. Yeah, that was one of the most amazing things out of this is to watch how fast uh, the com community came together and rose up. And yeah. it was instant and it was everybody. And I think the whole country is thinking about the people of Lahaina and Maui and we've got to do something to honor all these families here. I hope so. Those two captains, so many heroes here on Maui. When we come back on this special edition of Nightline, the heartbreaking humanitarian crisis here, the families in desperate need. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.